Well, I, it is my honor, and I got to follow that guy. Where did he go? <laughs> I had to follow him. Man, I was sitting there, and I'm going, and I'm after that? <laughs> Can't quite do it. Quite. It made me think of the Apostle Paul where he said, hey, I don't come with those eloquent words, you know. I don't come with all that wisdom and those big words and the big voice. And, and, but I'll tell you what I do come with. And I want to share that. I've got about 10 messages inside me this, this evening. Just your worship was, okay, I should go that way. No, I should go that And I follow rabbits anyway. So if I go on a rabbit trail and you don't hear the rest of the story and you wonder what happened to whosoever I was talking about, well, you just have to come to the 40 hours that we put on and, and you know, at our, then I get to somehow in those 40 hours in our intensive weekends, I do get to the end of one story or two, all right? In 40 minutes, I'm going to try, all right? But I don't mind you lifting up your hands and say, what happened to so-and-so, right? Because in my mind, I've already answered the question, and then I come to find out later, you have no idea what happened to Joe. Right? And, and so you're going to go home and you're going to go crazy and you think, I wonder what happened to Joe. Right? So if I do that, just raise your hand, just say, talk about Joe. What's the end of the story? I left that story at a very high point one time and it was about my daughter and they don't know, they didn't know she lived or died. You know? And it was like, is she alive? Is it okay? Like, it was like, well, in my head, she's still alive and doing well because she drives me nuts. So I know she's alive, you know. So I don't mind. Whatever you need to do, um, it won't bother me. But if you start running around the church, I was at a church one time, and there was this woman that was running around, and, and she was getting it, man, and, and, and I, I didn't judge her, and I thought, do I go with her? Do I and so I kept following her. Well, I already follow whatever moves right? It, that was really difficult. So if you start dancing, I'll dance with you. I, I'm very much an Ecclesiastes kind of person. I'll sing with you, even though I don't sing and my children have begged me not to sing. I'll dance with you. Whatever you're doing, I'll do, all right? But if, if you want me to stay on track, then help me out, okay? And just pay attention and whatever I don't finish, just let me know. I don't know why I was going there and why I'm revealing all this stuff. Well, I'll tell you why I'm revealing. <laughs> because, um, you know, part of the subject tonight is about revealing and how healing that is. But before I go there, I want to know if you're a millennial church. And I think, and, and I understand you have to have been born somewhere in the 90s, right? Are those the millennials, 80s, 90s? Is it 90s? 90s. Okay, so there's a few of you here. That means you all have one of these. They're called smartphones. I call them stupid because they make me feel stupid. They don't make me feel smart at all, okay? I remember getting mad at my daughter when I first start, started uh, using Facebook, and I was mad at her about something, and I saw her pop up on my phone, and she was on Facebook, and I thought, ha, huh, I can talk to her right now because she's not going to answer the phone, but I, I know she's on here. I can see her. So I'm just giving it to her right, on the phone, and she goes, mom, mom, and I said, yeah, you want more, are you listening to me now, now you're answering me, she goes, and so are a thousand other people, <laughs> and I said, what does that mean, she goes, uh, just look at the viewers, they're coming on real quick, and I'm going, those people can see what I'm saying, you know, I, I had to learn real quick, but I don't, I try not to do that anymore, um, I've learned a little bit. But because you're a millennial, I want you to get your phone out, okay? And I want you to look around because this is a nice full place. I'm going to take and, and smile, okay? So smile because I'm going to, now let me figure it out. Okay. See? Now smile real big because I'm doing a selfie. Okay? So you're going to get famous somewhere. Okay, there we go. All right. Now you get your phone out and take a selfie with me in it. Come on. Let's do it. Come on. Hurry up. Take selfies of each other. Right? So we can get this out of the way. There we go. All right. See? Now you've got some selfies. You can post it. You can say, this is us. Oh, look at that. This is us. There we go. See? Now you can just put that hashtag, this is us. Did you get that hashtag? This is us conference, right? So put that on there and just post it out there. All right. 
I am going to get to some wisdom, I think. <laughs> I think. But I'll tell you, I may not come as, as eloquent as our last guest that was here, and I'm not Mustafa or whatever that <laughs> name is, um, and, and I've never played that role. But I do believe that wherever I go, and in this church, it's not going to be hard to elevate the faith. Because I believe that for the last 25 plus years, I have been able to elevate the faith no matter where my feet have touched the ground. Elevate the faith that our families can do exactly what Jesus said we could do, and that was love one another. You know what, in, in first, I, I think I've got that verse, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.2, I think it is. If you can put that verse up, that first one, not the first one, the second one actually, that says that in your relationships, that's what we're talking about. This is us, right? Us is relationship. Us means more than me, all right? And Jesus, this was what we were told. In your relationships with one another, with who? With one another. Have the mindset of Christ Jesus. So let's open that up and figure out what that mindset is tonight. Because if you can leave this building with just the thought that my only responsibility in my relationships, whether it's with my family, with my spouse, with my children, and I say that in parentheses, with my children, because the mind of Christ when I'm dealing with my children is not always the mind of Christ. But that is what he's saying in all your relationships, not in some, not in the ones that you like, not in the, the ones that you enjoy, but in all. You know the person that really triggers you? You got those kind of people in your life? The ones that really bug you? You know, I have them. And it's those ones that I have to actually literally pick up the helmet and stick it on my head and say, in that relationship, I need the mind of Christ, and God, do I need it. God, do I need it, right? But it starts in our homes. It starts in first the very family around you. And if you can leave tonight, how many of you have believed, maybe you are a believer, maybe you're not a believer. But if you are a believer, how many of you have prayed at least once, God send us revival? At least once, yes? Stop praying that. Stop it. You know why? Because he told you, you are the revival. You are it. And the disciples were saying that. You know, when they came to Jesus, they said to him, he says, Jesus, tell us how they, they know how we're Jews. You know why they were asking, how will they know we're Christians? Because they'd always known how to show the world they were Jews. They were circumcised. They had festivals. They had everything to show that they were the Jewish, the people of God. But now they were Christian. It was a whole different ball game. And they said, now how are they going to know who we are? And he didn't give them a whole list of stuff. He didn't give them the Ten Commandments. He didn't tell them, well, if you do this and you do that, and if your wife submits to you, oh, that's a good one, right? Don't even get me going there, right? <laughs> then they'll know that you are a Christian. He said, no. You know how they're going to know? They're going to know by the love you have one for another. Amen. I'm telling you right now, if we had love one for another in the church, if we had love one for another in our marriages, if we had love for our children, no matter where they're at, no matter what closet they come out of, if we had love one for another, we would not be able to contain the revival. So stop praying for it. Go out in love. And the revival happens. Go out in love. Revival happens. But we are broken. And hurt people hurt people. And it's hard to get the mind of Christ when you are hurting. It is difficult. I'm not saying it's not. 
uh, Pastor Virginia just said, I, I wrote a book since the time that she saw me. Uh, before my husband passed away, we had written a book together. This one here was absolute shock to me because we were not known authors. It was a self-published book. But I did a trip, one of those trips where I was obedient. I did not want to go. I did want to come here. It's an honor for me to be here. But I was asked to go to India. And before I thought about it, the words, a pastor asked me, would you come to India with us and do a, a, a pastor's marriage conference? And I said, yes. And then I got to the parking lot, and I thought, what, what? No, I am not going to India. What was I doing? My mouth said something that... I wasn't in control of. And, and then I thought, I, I've got to find a way to get out of it. I don't want to go to India. I'd been there twice before, and I never wanted to go again. You know, and here now as a single woman I was going. But I knew why God had me go there. And it was, I had the honor of sharing the stage with uh, Greg Smalley, Gary Smalley's son from Focus on the Family. And he said, Tina, what, what are you going next? Where are you going next? What are you doing next? And he goes, because I feel there's a book in you. And I said, oh, yeah, there's a book in me. Nobody will buy it. <laughs> and he said, why? And I said, because it's about spiritual damage. And he goes, yeah, nobody's going to buy that. <laughs> I said, Jesse, I can't sell, but it's a really good book. He goes, nah, you're not, you're not selling that one. And I said, well, I've thought of another title. And he goes, what is it? And I said, it's, see, my original title, I, I'm trying to forgive them for this. And so, you know, I'm trying to say it without resentment. Again, I'm revealing. That's my subject tonight, <laughs> revealing. Um, my original subject was the other woman saved my marriage, and she really did. It was infidelity in our marriage. Well, Focus on the Family loved the title, and, um, and so all along we went with that title until the end, and the publisher, Tyndale, said, uh, I don't know about our market liking that, you know, the other woman thing and saving your marriage. And so they, they changed it and tried to make it a little bit more spiritual. So how God used the other woman. Well, they've been hit hard. Because, you see, people, who haven't, people who've read the book on Amazon, uh, it's become a bestseller, and it, it, it has gotten my five stars, except now it's down to about 4.8, 4.3, somewhere in there. Because some people that haven't read the book that are religious, I love them with the mindset of Christ. I really love them with the mindset of Christ. Amen. Amen. And um, they felt it was a very unscriptural, unbiblical, and one comment was that I needed psychological help. And I said, thank you for the diagnosis. Now I don't have to go pay a psychiatrist at $350 an hour. I, I accept that I need psychological help. Right? Most people need to go get that diagnosed. And, um, but they, at least they're honest. They said they haven't read the book. They just, just read the title. And then very unbiblical that I would be the, that I, me being the victim would take responsibility for my husband's affair. Can I just be really honest with you? Can, can I speak frankly? Yeah, frankly. I didn't take his pants down. He had his affair all by himself. It was his affair, okay? But this is a book of accountability. And they twisted it that I took responsibility for the affair. This book is not about that. And you don't have to have had infidelity in your marriage. You can be single and read this. And there's exercise in here to get to know yourself because this is us, is in every relationship. And the reason it is so powerful is because it's about you as a person and how you show up with the mind of Christ or with not the mind of Christ. I showed up in my marriage 
long before the affair took place, not with the mind of Christ, but with a broken, hurt, unnurturing, with a lot of vows, with a lot of promises that I would never be hurt again, and with a lot of hurt inside of me and a locked up heart. But you see, the religious damage came in as a young person even, though church was a beautiful place for me. If it weren't for church, I don't think I would have survived my teen years. I don't think I would have survived a lot of the sexual abuse and the, and the abandonment and the loss over and over again. It was always the church that was steady for me. But there's a couple of things I heard in church, I heard in church and maybe you've heard it too, that was hurtful. And one of those things that I heard in church that day that I found out about this was that I had the right to divorce my husband. And the church would continue to support me if I did. See, we already had quite a significant ministry at the time. And that's why I wanted to write a book about spiritual damage. Because I believe in Matthew 19, 8. And I thank God that both my husband and I were mature enough in the faith to not take that counsel. Somebody tells you that a ministry is more is worth saving more than a family, run. Come on. Run. Okay. Because that's not God's order. That's not God's order. And so I thank God that we were able to look at each other and I had an encounter with God that I pray that every, whether you buy the book or not, hear me tonight. I ask that you ask yourself, what part do I play in my relationships? What part do I bring to the relationship table? Because what you bring, if you bring hurt, that's what's going to grow. If you bring anger, that's what's going to grow. If you bring a locked up heart, that's what's going to grow. And so before I, I go into the message tonight, um, these books are at the back. Our first book is there too. But one thing, focus on, the, just to finish that part of the story, they attacked focus for even allowing a book so unbiblical to go out, yet they hadn't read it. They do actually say on, in their comment that they haven't read it. So at least they were honest about that, right? So I can love them for that. You always look for the things you can love in people, and then love grows, right? And, uh, but Focus was really sweet. They called me, and they said, are you okay? And I said, well, it's you they're attacking, not me. They just told me I needed mental help. I said, I, I've known that for a long time. But they can't believe what, you know, what, that you would sponsor someone like this, and that the other woman could be used of God, because how God used the other woman, imagine that, actually writing that, how can God use the other woman? How could God use, and all they said to me goes, Tina, we're, we're all about selling books. Every time you get a bad comment, your book sales go up. I said, should I write some of myself? I know a lot of stuff about myself that's not really good. You know, they said, no, seriously, don't, don't take it hard. And I said, okay. So I accepted that. But I want to go on that one comment tonight. Imagine that it's so unbiblical. I mean, that's what they're trying to say. This is a dangerous book, was one of the comments, an unbiblical book. Because how could someone even say, and how could focus have such a title that God could use the other woman? And I started thinking about Jesus. And I thought about the well. Remember the woman at the well? Six times, no, five times she was married. The man she was living with, now she's cohabitating, okay? He's the sixth man. She's in shame. She comes in the heat of the day so that the other, woman, the other women don't scorn her. 
And God uses her as the first evangelist ever. Woman evangelist. And they all heard her and listened to her. And many came to Christ. Did God not? She was the other woman for five men. What about the, the, the woman that was ready to be stoned? How can God use the other woman? How can God use you? How can God use me? One of the biggest miracles that, you, that can happen to you that happened to me, that's why I bring faith everywhere I go. It doesn't matter how low you've gone. There is nowhere that you can go that there is no hope. I've seen marriages, the marriages I work with, the marriages that I work with are usually 911s. That means they've already got their separation on the table. Some of them, Mariner's Church, which is a Southern California church, has sent probably, they said last year, so before 2019, the count was about 500 couples that they had sent through. They are still tracking those couples, and that's in the last five years. They are still tracking those couples that have come through our intensive, and they have over an 80% of couples have gotten back together. Okay? Now, that's great news, but they've started a new ministry. They remarry the divorced people to the same person they divorced. They've remarried. 15 marriages in the last three years. And why did they come if they were already divorced? Because they were crazy with the kids. So they come with the kids. We don't promise that you're not going to break up. We just promise that you will get healthy or we'll give you your money back. We will set you on a path of the mindset of Christ. That's what we're going to do. Now, Pastor mentioned that I've worked with Gene Simmons, Billy Baldwin, and many others that I can't mention, and also, you know, uh, a lot of people that come to the retreat parts, which are private ones, they will come, and a lot of, you know, when, when I worked with, that's when I got a bit of attack. You got attacked for Halloween. I got attacked for going on the Housewives of Orange County, <laughs> and uh, just, where is it, what is Tina doing now? And how could she do that? You know, and besides, I was on the Gene Simmons show. I was on the Housewives. You're not allowed to mention Jesus. So to a Christian, God love them. I have the mindset of Christ. I think this message is for me tonight. Um, God love them. But they can't understand. If you can't even preach Jesus, then why would you go on a show like that? You know how many people have come through our weekends because I was on that show? And then I preached Jesus to them? Right? I mean, I'll go wherever in the darkness to bring hope and to bring light and to bring Jesus. Amen. Right? One of the housewives I worked with, they were not Christians. They accepted the Lord. Now they're teenage. Now they brought the, they've raised their kids in church. And it was about four or five months ago. I'm looking and I'm going, is that really her? The kid that was about this high now is a teenager leading worship. Come on. But I couldn't say the name of Jesus on TV. Wasn't it Frank, Francis Agassiz that said these words? Preach and use words if you have to. What's that about? Relationships. This is us. Now, I want to show you a picture of this is us. This is my family. And, uh, wow, I kind of look fat there. <laughs> we all look a little big. It's a screen, right? <laughs> it adds 10 pounds. That looks like about 50 right there. Um, but I look at that, and I, that's, that picture I took, when I was 18 years old. Because you see, I'm Italian, and you, if you're not married by 18, my sister was married at 17. I wasn't married yet, and I was 24. But at 18, my parents started me praying. You know, you got to find the husband, because 
seriously, at 24, they thought I was done. Like, my <laughs> childbearing years were done. Everything was done, you know. And they, they had settled themselves to think she'll never find the right one. He, you know, that, that was it. But at 18, that was the picture I took. Why do I say that? Because when the affair happened, it's that picture that the 18-year-old took that came back, not the reality of what I was going through. Because I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that part of having that family till death do us part had to start long before the trials came. What's your portrait? What portraits do you create a family of this is us? Now I can say this is us and I can show you that picture with all my heart, but I can also tell you that if that vision of divorce, you know, before we got married, I didn't come from a divorced home. My husband didn't come from a divorced home. And so before we got married, we got that sit down talk, you know, and, um, and so I, sat with my husband and we did the premarital counseling and all that and we decided that we would never use the word divorce when we were fighting okay so divorce was never going to be part of our language and we agreed to that but being Italian I just added a clause <laughs> you can imagine what it is right I said y you know my people right my people kill for a living. <laughs> so I promise you, we will never get divorced. But death, I don't know. I said, my dad has a friend. His name is Luigi. And my dad's name is Mario. And that really is true. That really is true. My uncle is Luigi, and my dad is Mario. And that's the truth. And I said, and when Mario and Luigi get together, you're you know, and you're blonde and blue-eyed, baby, you, you're already on the death row, you know, <laughs> just because you're blonde and blue eyes, you know. So, but seriously, we decided divorce would not be part of our marriage. And so when you see that picture and the infidelity happened, we already knew that word was not going to come out at that moment. And I want to tell you, if that decision had not been made when we made it in the marriage, he totally expected, because the Bible does say, or so we think it says, except for. But I'm going to show you something different tonight instead of except for, because that's what we grabbed hold of. Let me tell you who wouldn't be in this picture. That little one right there, she was nine years old when Ron passed away. That picture was taken in October of 2013, three months before Ron passed away. She wouldn't be in that, she wouldn't be in the picture because she came along two years after the affair. We adopted her. I thought we were taking care of a little girl and helping a single mom when she was three months old. It's not what happened. We ended up adopting her. The other person that wouldn't be in that picture is my daughter-in-law because we moved to save our marriage. And that meant the kids moved schools. He met her in high school, the last year of high school. You know, he would have met someone else. He's a good guy. But that girl right there is my Proverbs 31 woman like I've never met. I can honestly say that. I can honestly say that and go verse by verse. But you know what the best thing about her is? The Proverbs 32 part that she loves her mother-in-law. <laughs> That's the best part about her. Now I have three grandchildren and I wish, and, and I'm going to show you this video and I'm going to take time. And I don't usually show this video because it was, we actually, it was done for me. Um, and I don't usually show it, but because this is us, I want you to see the promise that came because we made the decision that Matthew 19, verse 8, 
This is what saved our marriage. This is what we built our seminar on. This is what we built our healing workshops on, on Matthew 19, 8, because we healed with that verse. And it was one of those verses where it was very typical for the Pharisees to want to trip up Jesus. And they came to him and they said, Jesus, do you believe in the law of Moses that allowed divorce? Jesus never denied the law. And this is what he said. Do we have the verse? Let's put the verse up there. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession. Listen to that verse. Only as a concession to your hard hearts. There's another version that says Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of the heart. Not because of adultery. You think California is a no-fault divorce? They could divorce their wives for burnt soup. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. They could just put away their wife for any reason. Okay? And Jesus is saying, but that's not what God intended in the beginning. And it's the verse after that that actually says ex Jesus uses that exception law of adultery. But if you look at this verse, and if you study that next verse, Jesus is saying it wasn't intended this way, but because of the hardness of the heart, we end up in adultery. And then we don't know how to unharden the heart. And I believe that's what saved our marriage, is God showed me the hardness of my heart. I judge a church by the rocks they give me. You have a very healthy church, okay? And I know that. Because the picture I sent of the rocks that I wanted in this jar were very big. And they got me pebbles. <laughs> right? Not boulders. This doesn't represent my heart. My heart had really big ones, and, and there's no big ones that are big enough here. But you see, what this shows me is that the hardness of the heart is what we've picked up in our journey we call life. And we picked up, I picked up as a little girl, anger. And it was much bigger than this, but anger kept me safe. Anger was an anchor for me. When I was getting hurt and I was being sexually abused, as long as I had anger as a wall around me, I didn't feel. But later, anger stayed with me when a friend wasn't nice to me. Then it came to marriage with me. But not only anger came to marriage with me, I tell you, this is really hard for me to, because <laughs> it's so little. <laughs> but control came with me into my marriage. Shame came with me into my marriage. And I just gave you a sheet of paper with the three steps. And right there in the first one of the R3 factor, what I call, and this is what we unpack in a long weekend. You've got the R1, which is reveal. Reveal is about yesterday. See, if we don't reveal the rocks of yesterday that hardened our heart, Okay, if we don't reveal these rocks, then they come between us. So when it says that they'll know us by the love we have one for another, these rocks block love. This is your heart. So it doesn't matter how, see, it doesn't matter how small they are. Because it still blocks. It covers it. You can't see through it. You hide behind the shame rock and behind the guilt rock and behind the anger rock, behind the resentment rock. Is that starting to sound familiar? The hardness of the heart is built on that. But you see, when, you're hard, when your heart is hardened, you can't let love in and you can't give love out. Do you see that? And that's why as Christians, we hurt each other more than is necessary, but it's because we're wearing protective gear, and it's not the helmet of salvation and the breastplate. It's not that. 
We're wearing protective gear that's called hardness of heart. All right? So we start to reveal that hardness of heart. And that's what God asked me to do. And I share about it in the book, how he just looked at me. He goes, Tina, don't be a victim. What part did you play in this? And I thought he was going to start telling me I burnt the dinner. <laughs> or I didn't make dinner. And I thought God was going to take me on a walk of everything I'd done wrong and not submitting to my husband. And instead, he did it. He took me to a time when I was 22 years old. And I made a vow I would never love a man like that again because I'd been so hurt. And so I took that nurture part of my heart, that soft, part and I buried it and when my husband needed me the most guess what I did I asked my best friend to be there for him I said you know what it's like to go through the death of a parent I don't and he is just closed down my husband had never been depressed a day in his life I'd never had to be there for him and now I didn't know how and you know what God did he took me back to that moment when I made that vow and he said, break the vow, I'll give you back your heart, and you'll have your marriage back. And he said all that within the first 24 hours. But you see, without revealing that, I couldn't change or heal. God had to show me my yesterday so that I could change and heal. Then God said, now I'll give you back your heart. You've got to take it back. God couldn't give it back to me. I had to break that vow. I had to do the work. So the reveal is so important. The second one is you rewrite today. He said, today, pick up your heart. Pick it up and give it to your husband. What was he saying? Go and love. Go and love. And so you rewrite. And then I'm going to quickly go through this. Like I said, we, we take about 35 hours to go through this. But the best one is to renew. And you know where that is in the word in Philippians? Right? Put on the mind of Christ. And what is the mindset of Christ? Whatsoever things are true, of good report, honest, Put it on. Put it on. Notice it says put it on. And what did Jesus, what was the mindset of Christ? That he was willing to lay down his life for us. While we were yet. While we were yet. That yet. We weren't good yet. And we'll never be good to deserve that. So if you'll renew today, if you'll say, God, I only have one responsibility. You know what the hardest thing was for me to get over? This was the hardest thing, and I want to end with this, and then I want to show. Do I have a minute, three minutes to show? I've got time? Okay. 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 What I want you to hear is that once I was willing to reveal and then go to that next step of rewrite. See, rewrite takes forgiveness. The hardest part of forgiveness was to forgive myself. Not to forgive him and her. That too had to be part of it. You can't rewrite without forgiving. You can't even rewrite your heart without forgiveness. We have to accept Christ's forgiveness in order to come in to the love of Christ. Right? You can't just say, well, yeah, I know there's a God and, and he's maybe love, maybe not. But you have to accept forgiveness. The hardest person sometimes to forgive is yourself or to accept forgiveness is yourself. But there was another thing that was really difficult. And that was when I was asked this question. And the pastors that told me to leave him, and I... I just went, I, I don't think that's right, and, and I think there's hope. And, and, you know, we went along that journey. But about two weeks into the journey, they said, and we'd made the decision already two weeks in, they said, how will you ever trust him again? 
That's a big question. How many of you believe there should be trust? Raise your hand. Should there be trust in a marriage? Well, if this was a test, you all failed. <laughs> Every single one of you that raised your hand failed. Because you see, that question haunted me. And one Sunday morning, it was week number two, and I couldn't get rid of that nightmare. How will I trust? How do we rebuild trust? One of the biggest things I deal with in the book is how do you rebuild trust? I went to church all by myself that Sunday. I sat in the very back row, not in the front, where we usually sat as leaders. Sat in the very back row, and I had a hoodie on. Made sure no one saw me, because it was a lot of shame. And the pastor stopped in his message. And he said, I don't know who this is for. It's not part of my message. And he said, but somebody out there needs to hear that God never told you to trust people. He told you to trust God and love people. Amen. You can clap on that one. I didn't stay for the rest of the service. I walked out, and I said, God, I can go home and love, and I can trust you with my heart. Not, I don't need to trust him with my heart. I need to trust you with my heart. That doesn't mean we didn't create safety and rules of engagement, and it doesn't mean we didn't build a solid foundation on trusting God with our marriage with our hearts, but our responsibility, you as a married person, you as a father, you as a son, you as a, all of it, as a friend, as an employee. You know what I'm sick of hearing? Don't hire Christians. I'm sick of it. They should be demanding. They should look on your application. Are you a Christian? Good, I want you. Is there 10 more of you? Come on. And not because we're the best at everything. Not because we score A plus on every test. But you know why? Because of the love one for another. Yeah. Now let me show you this video. This is us. And this was the reward that I still live in today. Even though my husband passed away, I've never asked why. Because when he passed, he said, Babe, promise me. First of all, you won't quit the ministry. You'll keep going out there and sharing our story. You'll keep telling them. You'll keep telling them I messed up. But God took our mess and made it a message of hope. Don't ever stop telling that story. There's no shame in it because God's in it. There's no shame in it. If he can use Rahab, he can certainly use the other woman. Don't be ashamed. Give your heart to God.